Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. <laughs> We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric, and we have a completely normal show. Nothing strange is going on yeah. right now. It's uh, uh, it's just one of those shows where, uh, so today on Double Feature, we're going to do two films. Yes. Um, they're yeah. horror films, just like, you know, your standard Double Feature show. It's like the next couple weeks. One of them's be... an old classic movie. One of them's a new, uh, it's it's uh, Joss Whedon, so there's a notable director True. involved. I mean, basically, you couldn't have come up with a more cookie-cutter version of Double Feature to have stumbled upon today. Yeah. Podmanity. <laughs> we could not have stumbled more either I think is what happened <laughs> so I don't know where to begin man like, I think you begin in a closet yeah we have to talk about this a little bit right yeah okay so we wanted to record today's show on a revolutionary new device uh -huh. called the iPhone 5 yeah and that's why this is a tech demo just to show off new technology we embrace it here on double feature as you know we often have lots of extra money laying around to buy new technology right now here's what happened something broke yep <laughs> Uh, a cable literally stopped yeah. working. The new, the new studio. Well, okay, so we want to do a test run. Yeah. We're in the Edgewater Beach Hotel, the right. one we talked yeah, about. We are. What was that? Piranha, right? Yeah. Um, we're not going to do the next couple shows here. This was just kind of a first. I just wanted to get in here and see if we can do it. And we waited way last minute on this show, as yeah. happens. You're busy, whatever. Um, and now, when we get here, we're ready to go. We have no other time, we assume everything's going to work, and there's some cabling that just, long story nobody cares about. We were basically faced with a decision. The decision was, do the show the right way where it sounds good with the professional microphones uh -huh. and the, you know, the setup that we have sure. tweaked and really perfected over the years yeah. uh, to make sound as good as it does on really no budget. Mm -hmm. And then the show goes up a week late. Right. Uh, you know I can't do that. We've never missed a show. No, we just can't. It's, um, can't do it. And I guess what the other option is uh, to sit in a little closet <laughs> to minimize room noise. Well, so we have this big hotel. We thought yeah. about the lobby. Sure. And there's this huge... Um, you know, the area in the mezzanine and uh -huh. all these cool places we could record. It's a really nice building. But uh, honestly, just too fucking noisy everywhere. Yep. And so we are... And the, room, and, <laughs> and the room that the studio's in is still terribly echoey. Yeah. I can still hear slight echoes. I know, from out there. Um, from out there. From we out have there. a lot of different space out here we can record it. It's just not going to work. So we're sitting in a closet, <laughs> Indian style, on the floor, <laughs> yep. delivering to you the cabinet of Dr. Caligari and Cabin in the Woods. So sorry, and I, I, don't, I think it's the right decision. Oh, I definitely do. Honestly, if everyone tells us it was the wrong decision, we probably would still do it. Yeah. So. And if you've got a problem with it, that's why we have chapters. Great. You could, no, it's, all the chapters are going to sound just as bad today. Yeah, but they can just skip all the way to the end and find out what's going to be next instead right. of sitting here for 45 minutes. Yeah, next week will be fine. Okay, so we're going to spoil the shows. If you haven't seen uh, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, it does uh, a lot of firsts. We're going to yeah. talk about a lot of that stuff. Really, um, you know, we use the word old school to describe movies that pay tribute to movies from 30 years ago. Yeah. This is 1920s. I yeah. mean, this, this is old is school. As old as it gets. As this is the oldest school. <laughs> yeah. And then there's um, Cabin in the Woods, which is modern and also kind of twisty in its own way. Yeah. And that'll have a shit ton of spoilers, too. Yep. So use the chapters, they're embedded in your thing, just skip uh, skip over. I hope people can even hear us. Yeah, it This is fun. so absurd, we have not gotten across <laughs> how fucking absurd what's going on right now is. The things we do. Are you, I fucking love this audience <laughs> so much, like, that's why this is happening. Yeah. Oh, Jesus Christ. Okay, um, the first movie. Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. So you get some inner titles, because you got a silent film. Uh-huh. Um, I think we talked about that. What was it? A music Box? It was a Music Box something? Massacre. There was a Buster Keaton movie. Was it The Haunted House? Right? Um, yeah. yeah. It was that called was The Haunted one. House. Sure. Uh, all I remember about that movie, in retrospect, is the scene where the stairs turn into a ramp. 
Okay. <laughs> and he slid down. <laughs> sure. Um, but at, that was at the music box, and that was live accompanied, which is what right. they used to do in right. the 20s with silent film. So explain film. that a little bit. Well, it was, um, so they project the film because mm -hmm. they hadn't yet figured out how to record music. <laughs> is um, that the problem? Mostly. They didn't know how to line um, it they up. Couldn't, huh? Yeah, they couldn't, they couldn't make it work. So they would have the, they would have an, an, an accompanist mm -hmm. come in and they would have them, uh, they would have them play the the score to yeah, sure. the film while the film played in the theater, uh, and that was where you got sound from. And and there were various and sundry different interpretations because they didn't have sheet music. And uh, and as time went along, they started recording scores, which is why the version we watched. Sure, we didn't have to sit there and <laughs> play our own music, right? <laughs> I'm along um, with it. And that has, actually, that's turned into a, a thing that people, people did a lot with Metropolis, too. Oh, sure. Where... They'd kind of make their own... They made, where bands, yeah. you know, sure. bands and artists and all these different people do their own interpretations of the score to the cabinet of Dr. Sure. Caligari. And, it, I mean, it results in a terrible mess of how the hell am I supposed to watch this right, film? What's right. the truest way? Because sure. that's what we're always talking about, the yeah. integrity of the film. That's why we go to director's cuts even when it's Blade Runner or Donnie Darko. Right. Um, because <laughs> right. that's the way the film was originally envisioned. And when you have something where an entire, I mean, score is such a massive part of a film. Sound yeah. Yeah. is such a massive part of a film. Sure. When that's missing, how do you find the most integritous one sure yeah and it's amazing that you come at this right away with the score i mean i think about the visual stuff i that comes sure. from our backgrounds yeah. or whatever right but um the inner titles themselves are this entire thing feels like a play that you know elementary school kids yeah are it on. definitely you know does I mean? sure between the sets and the you know the inner titles are they're Jagged, all the fonts in the yeah. movie are really jagged hard to around read. this. Yeah, they are hard <laughs> to read. Not even in German and hard yeah. to read. Um, jagged and sharp, and they almost look like, uh, you know, they're made out of construction paper. It's that yeah. South Park kind of yeah. look, really. It is. Um, everything is, is fire and lightning and zigzags, except when they have the inner titles that are the newspaper style. Yeah. You know, they actually switch the style sure. of it. And well, it's, in the diary. Yeah, yeah. It's so much of a variation from you know, black card, white font. You also get to see, you know, I mean, Dr. Caligari's signature before uh, he sees the clerk is highly stylized, yeah. too. There's so much style to to all of this. It's part of the aesthetic, I guess, of... Um, when we talk about Tim Burton, this has come up a couple times, but sure. in various other movies we've done, that German expressionism. Yeah. And I feel like this is a really classic example, but it also stands out a lot because yeah. it's... It's heavy. It's just got a lot of that stuff well, in it. And it came out so early. Mm. Um, I mean, you get a lot of the, the, the scene in the film that I remember being one of the more unsettling is when they go to that um, the carnival, mm -hmm. and you actually have the working carousels that are moving in front of the map paintings. Sure. But they're on angles. They're right, not right. straight, so the carousels are even in this weird, <laughs> right. jagged, off character. Right, everything's wobbly. And, and it's, doesn't, it yeah. just, I mean, seeing it functional makes it even more unsettling because it takes it out of the artistic, sure. you know, version of a painting or a right. backdrop and turns it into a physical, fucked up shit. Well, when I think expressionism, I guess I think about it as a lot of what Tim Burton has picked up from it. Yeah. Because, you know, I've seen a lot of Tim Burton movies. Mm -hmm. That was really early in me watching film. I saw yeah, a lot same of those. And so when I learned what that was, I immediately, you know, I latched onto all the kids. It's like film noir. You yeah. start thinking about, okay, well, what do people, when people hail back to film noir, what kind of things are they doing? And so you go back to the old stuff and you look for that. Sure. So, I mean, I think Tim Burton, and I think, you know, the big black eyes and the, uh, yeah. the contrast. But this movie is so much about those jagged angles yeah. and the zigzags. Spirals. And, and Yeah, everything just being uh, completely off. You know, it looks like it was done. I get the feeling as I watch this that the stage is so small that if you were to see anything outside the physical frame that they're working in, it would just be, you know, yeah. it, the the illusion would be gone. Rigging crew. Yeah, right, right. Sandbags. As if you're watching something on a stage 
And if you were to, you know, look on the left or right hand side behind the curtain, there's people holding stuff yeah. and you know, a lot of movies now give you the illusion so much so, so very immersive that you feel like you're in a world. Right. But every time I watch Caligari, I feel like I'm watching a stage production. Right. I can feel that just to the left or right, there is, you know, it's a it's a performance um, they're putting on. Well and and that's only I almost said made worse, but it's not made worse. <laughs> sure. It's just made stronger by right. the fact that it's a 20s film and it's one of those crank cameras. Yeah. And everything is twitchy and, and all the walking sure. kind of feels fast and slow at the same time. Sure, and, sure. And, uh, and the other thing that's really strange is because it's a German film, mm -hmm. all the lines are in German. So your inner titles come in and it's an English line and then they move their mouth and it just doesn't look <laughs> right, like they're saying real all. words. Yeah, somebody else is making up a story to, yeah. to put on top of this. And uh, it just, it it manages to, for a film from the 20s, be one of the more unsettling things to watch. Sure, the, sure. The more invested you get into the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, things like Cesar sure. turn into a sure. very uncomfortable thing to watch just because he's moving so slow and deliberately, mm -hmm. but everything around him, the camera's moving, the light's twitching and tweaking, and sure. it's terrifying. Well, while we're doing a uh, train wreck unedited show, um, <laughs> let's come back to the aesthetic thing later, because I want to talk about the, uh, you were really good at pronouncing this, Som somnambulist. Somnambulist? Yeah, it means this sleepwalker. Is, this is a fucking thing. Cesar the somnambulist. Mm -hmm. So as soon as they use the word somnambulist, uh, I'm watching this movie. When I saw it for the first time, I don't know what the fuck that yeah, is. I don't know what's... What are the characteristics of this thing we're centering the movie around? It's it's somebody who... I mean, basically, it's hypnosis. At least that's how the yeah. film is treating sure. it. Um, it means... Somnambulist just means sleepwalker. Sure. Person who walks That's like an sleep. actual term. I mean, right. people... But it it doesn't, doesn't, that is like an actual term. Yeah. This is a scientific show. <laughs> this is expert opinion and fact here. Um, but it's it's not some. It doesn't necessarily mean that your will is broken and you will kill people because a creepy guy with three strips of hair tells you to. Sure, sure. So there's the the will breaking that yeah. we're talking about. There's also the carny trick of reading your future, or whatever, uh -huh. and the carny trick of a dummy. Yeah, yeah, was, <laughs> yeah, the dummy is one of the only things in the movie that I feel really breaks from how, uh, you know, everything else, like I said, feels like an elementary school sure. set, but in a creepy way. And I see that, you know, inflatable fucking yeah. whatever dummy. And it's the one time that I do kind of giggle during the, during the whole movie. Well, and the thing about the dummy that was really funny is I was told that this film is one of the first films with the with a big twist. Oh, sure. And then the dummy happened. <laughs> and I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, there is no way that <laughs> this film's that's the big first twist, twist yeah. is, is a dummy. Turns out it was a dummy the entire time. Turns out Christian Bale's twins. Oh, my God. So he knows secrets, and he's been sleeping 23 years, and that's, you know, that's his thing. He's uh, really twiggy, and the way he twitches and moves, I mean, that's a lot of, it coincides with that jerky camera work. Yeah. This is me trying to transition back to the aesthetic and a couple other things I wanted to talk about. I guess I just really wanted to hit on the design because my favorite thing about the movie is not even really a lot of the stuff it's, it's known for and its twists and its ending and all this crazy stuff. But, I mean, the way everything in the movie appears to be made out of you know, wood, rope, and tarps, yeah. I, as if there isn't a single fucking thing in the whole movie uh -huh. that's not constructed of those three materials. And they're all painted. It's all yep. these really thick brush strokes and yeah. everything. Um, the, you know, the town and the distant houses are the worst because uh -huh. they're the most obviously fake, the most obviously, you know, props or whatever. Caligari's trailer, though, is my favorite piece of the whole. Yeah. I mean, that, that carousel thing you mentioned is yeah. great. But when he, the thing about the trailer is it looks like they intend it to just be off in the distance, no one will question this. Yeah. But people have to get in and out of it. Uh -huh. And just seeing the, the fucking cardboard whatever door flip yeah. open, yeah. and it just looks like the thing is going to, plus it's built on an angle, so it looks like it's about to collapse yeah. <laughs> at any time. And I just watch it hoping that they'll get through this scene they'll and everybody, it, yeah, everybody will be the okay. The structural integrity of the film. <laughs> just, you know, watching someone go into or, or out of that trailer is one of my favorite things. But it also, that design allows for things to be more surreal, I think. You have... Um, doors on angles that they couldn't really be on. Yeah. 
or a curved wall. Sure. Uh, buildings are built like, um, I feel like we've talked about the mystery spot on the show before, but I don't know. I are don't you recall with it. Oh, yes, the, I do, the with sort the of, fake gravity. Yeah, mystery spot's like a tourist attraction in thing. W Wisconsin Dells? Well, they build them in a lot of places, but they they claim these places are gravity vortexes, uh -huh. vortices, Yeah, and it's really just a house built on a 20-degree angle. Yeah, And so you can do these tricks. I'll link off to it. We don't really have time to talk about it, but just, you know, water flows uphill and all oh this. Oh, my God. Well, water appears to flow uphill, but you're actually sloped yeah. so the water just flows normal at a slight incline but it looks like it's going uh -huh. uphill um, a lot of different illusions just because you're on that that 20 degree angle and that is you know when you see the live diagrams of that it all makes sense but when you're watching it that's just like seeing everything being askew and dr caligari gives you this sense of unease and it's part of i mean when they get to these different scenes where you know things become more nightmarish as stuff really starts to spiral out of control towards the end of the film the fact that they have these crazy brush strokes and things you know you get to a point where you start seeing titles in the sky yeah and you barely even consider how insane that is sure. because of the the physical makeup of the rest of the film the way everything else is designed and so that's kind of when we start to get into that twist too you know he goes to see caligari uh, you know, there's no patient here by that name or whatever. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go see the director? It turns out the director's Calgary. Right. And when he stumbles, you know, backwards through that trapezoid fucking door into uh, the hall back there or whatever, you know, what once looked normal now just looks like he's, it looks like they're doing a stylized scene yeah. of him falling backwards yeah. into a nightmare or something. So that's kind of where these twists start to unwind. You want to talk a little bit about what's, What's yeah. going on? Well, I mean, it's it's weird because it's something you don't see coming, mm -hmm. but in the overall scope of cinema, it's possibly one of the most used twists of all time. Yeah, well, now, sure. And I don't want, I mean, I can name a hundred films that end that way, um, but, you know, it. we don't well, spoil we, other films. We just spoil the ones we're talking about. We used to joke so much about, you know, Mind Freak and yeah. what a twist, and we'd give Shamlon a hard time all the uh -huh. time. And this is really kind of, I mean, how do you feel, okay, so as somebody I've been doing the show with uh -huh. this long, and you despising to ascending yeah. since the very, on record, since the beginning of this, do you have, like, this is going to be a weird question, but is there an emotional reaction when you go, there, you, you started it, you asshole? <laughs> I mean, do, it's, you, do you hold a grudge? It's, it's not, no, you know, I think I respect it more than I hold a grudge. <laughs> sure. Because even though... It, it's the forefather of a thing that I hate in cinema. <laughs> right. It didn't know it was that, and sure, it was brilliant sure. well, at the fun. time. Yeah. Right. Um, and it's still pretty. It's an effective. It's an effective twist comparably sure. to most twists. It's sure. it's similar to um, Son of Kong, which is the first sequel ever made. Oh yeah. And I don't begrudge Son of Kong for Transformers Four. It already feels like a turn when you get to you know the end and the. The director is exposed as Caligari, right. and that's it's a weird enough kind of tie in for the ending and everything's going on there. But then you get to the I mean, really seeing who's in the asylum, sure, and just how fucking loony it is, yeah. And I think they have to start slow with that because when you have this entire tale that's being spun outside the asylum, and then you get there to just land a twist on top of that feels so forced, so it almost feels like. Oh yeah, we get back to the asylum. Here's where there's sure. kind of a twist, and you know you find out about the director and this conspiratorial background of him mm -hmm. to you know find somebody at this insane asylum. And um, I I love seeing just that courtyard of just cartoonishly insane people. Yeah, I fucking feel like I belong there. It's yeah. just like, oh, a nice retreat. Uh -huh. You just stay there. You have no problems, nothing to do in your life, but yeah. just deal with your crazy. Yeah. That's your only objective <laughs> there, the day-to-day -day lives of those people. But then we peel back another layer, and we find, and this I love too, because when you start the movie for the second time, you know that the other guy he's talking to there, it, you know, he's actually the crazy one sure. in this scenario. Um, but they they really make that other guy seem fucking nutty in uh -huh. the beginning of the movie. And at the end of the movie, you, you come back and, oh, he's just a normal dude. He's just, you know, um, 
humoring this man's story. Oh, you yeah. Know, sitting there, letting him indulge in it or whatever, and he's the more sane yeah. of the two. But that's part of that twist that gets repeated so often is that you have, oh, we're seeing all these characters from the story he's created. Ah, uh, here they are and how he actually knows them. And it turns out it's this thing he's concocting based on other people from the asylum mm -hmm. that he's added to the story. Right. I mean, we've talked about those movies on our show. So there's so many that I, you know, like you said, we won't spoil them. Right, but, but they do I could, I could think of ten off yeah. the top of my head yep. that are just, oh, yeah, it was actually a story concocted based on all uh -huh. these characters that are really doing right. you know, this thing. That was Lost, though. I mean, yep. that was like every five fucking episodes of Lost would be, oh, wait, what is the, all those Dave episodes? Yeah. And, just, oh, what if this person's really, you know, from this and right. this person's all making it up in their head? That was everybody's fear with Lost. Mm -hmm. And then you have bookends, too. Sure. This yeah. is also uh, one of the first movies. I, we always hate doing that. That was the thing with, um, with Psycho and with Hitchcock stuff. And, you know, there's always going to be a first before the first. Right. But this was one of the first movies that ever was made. famous. <laughs> <laughs> for that too. One of the first movies that was ever made that was popular, uh, sure. popularized bookends and popularized the twist ending. And uh, also Living Dead Girl. Yeah, there's the Living Dead Girl Can't video. Can't pass that up, too. It's just, uh, it's just, I mean, the Living Dead, Rob Zombie's Living Dead Girl video is just Dr. Caligari. That's, there's <laughs> right. really not much more to say about that except I get to see Rob Zombie next week and fire in robots. I hate you. Oh, yeah, this is going to be a music-heavy episode because of Cabin in the Woods. I'm going to have to chat about that. About uh, OK Go? Just, no, not about OK Go. Is there an OK Go thing in Cabin in the Woods? Yeah, the first I... the the song the White Knuckle song that plays while the girl's in her underwear right at the beginning of the oh, film. Oh, really? That's I Hometown did... Boys OK Go. I did not know that. Yeah. I did not know that. The um, you know I think about that beginning scene of Cabin in the Woods and it's the title. That's the first oh, thing. Yeah. When I, I thought about, you know, we were going to talk about this movie today, and it's so hard to talk about something like Cabin in the Woods because it's Drew Goddard uh -huh. and it's Joss Whedon. Uh -huh. And those two names alone have so much history on the show that we have to just not talk about yeah, them, pretty I think, much. and that's just yeah. how we... I think Joss Whedon is going to come up a little bit in my conversation, but it's only, sure. it's, it's, it's more as an adjective. Right, right. That the, is subject. When you say the Whedon-esque <laughs> yeah. things. Yeah. Are, okay, thank you for that. Yeah, it's the, it's just one of those movies that's so heavy we could do a sure. whole show just yeah. on it. And so I was trying to think back, okay, what are the pivotal moments in this movie? Mm -hmm. You know, because we can talk about a lot of different things, but just going through each of these moments and what does it say about the film on a whole? Yeah. About what it's doing and why is it why does it impress me so much? And the title's the first one. Sure. I can well, it's of. it's really similar to Funny Games. I was just thinking the Funny that, Games yeah. title. It's a total tribute to that. Funny Games was so offsetting, too, especially because of that piece of music we talked about in there. But the rest of the movie, uh, where this almost seems to be, I mean, it's comedically pointing at yeah. something Funny Games did. It's these two people having what appears to be a, almost a mundane work conversation. Yeah. Although, I mean, I'm glued to it because you want to know what the fuck does this have to do with sure, Kevin? anything. With, yeah, with <laughs> anything. And then just when you're almost bored of it, you're just relaxed and they're in a fucking golf cart, you know, right. driving from one area of their giant data center technical facility to another. And this is just after what Sweden has they said Sweden's down and sure. now it's just us in Japan. Well Japan's got a perfect record. You're yeah, right. Doing what? What does this have to do with I Anything. came to see a horror movie. Yeah. It's the you almost feel like you're in the wrong movie. Wrong movie. How do you correct? Oh geez, did I show up to the wrong movie? Sure. Cabin in the woods. Yeah. That's how you do it. And the fucking ah, the scream and just the whole I love it. So, the death curse speakerphone guy. Okay. That's, that's, wow, we're just diving right in. Well, so this is the thing, right? Is if we're going to talk about, oh, this is a big mystery, and what the fuck is this movie about? Sure. And what's, where's the tone at? Yeah. Is this old school American horror? Is it... A sci-fi movie? Is it, yeah. Is it Slither? I mean, am I yeah. giggling at this? Should I be terrified of what's going to happen? Is it going to get fucked up? And, uh, spoiler, it's going to do all of that mm -hmm. and stuff. That's the beauty of Kevin in the Woods. But the death curse speakerphone thing is one of my favorite moments. Yeah. Because it appears to further inform you. And later when you kind of get what Cabin in the Woods is, you look back on that scene and you go, oh, yeah, that's a Cabin in the Woods kind of thing to do. Right. But when it's happening, 
you have this guy who's delivering. It's almost cheesy, but the movie in tone is treating it. He's the death curse guy. Yeah. He's, you know, the gasoline fucking salesman right. telling them, you know, giving them the, the foreboding. Uh, don't well, what, were they, what did they call him? The, the Harbinger? The Harbinger, yeah. yeah. But then the Harbinger talks to these guys from the beginning of the sure. movie. And the conversation is very grim and very serious, very grave. And you could think maybe the movie's just going to completely play it straight and maybe you're supposed to laugh on your sure. own and just, you know, you're enjoying this piece of art. But they give him a hard time yeah. about being on speakerphone. Well, they not only do they give him a hard time about being on speakerphone, they give him a hard time about being a harbinger. Well, that's, because yeah. he's, he Because, and the thing about Cabin in the Woods that I think works so well is that the film is literally in layers. There's yeah, right. there's the ground level sure, layer, sure. then the lab layer, which is level two, and then, you know, the bottom layer, which right. is where the film concludes. And each layer going down is laughing at the layer above it. Um, I had never thought about and, that. But before, that yeah. layer is taking it so seriously. Yeah, right. That because you it's have the hierarchy of, right. a, of a corporation. Yeah, you have you have the cabin in the woods layer. Yeah. And the scientists are down at the bottom being like, Oh yeah, Malachi, it's <laughs> oh, it's the end of times. Kill right, the right. kill the fool and the virgin. Ha 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 ha, you weirdo. Yeah. And then below them the ancients are going, Yeah, you guys are gonna fuck this shit up. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Yeah, so everybody's basically looking down at the other people, but in their roles, they feel like they are they are where the movie's at. Yeah, exactly. Know? They are doing the important thing right. day in and day out. Yeah, and, and the way the way the film ends up going is that the bottom layer ends up just you can't eventually it all crumbles upward. <laughs> um, it's getting a little convoluted here. But you basically the way the film goes is that no matter how seriously you take it all the layers will all eventually screw up. Sure, It right. just eventually, all, the, the stars will align that everything blows it. Well, you also get through those layers at their point of failure. Sure. That's right, well, that's, yeah. That's, at, the, that's things that are crumbling. Yeah. yeah. So as one thing fails and gives out, you fall into what's, what's right, below. Right, exactly. What's literally <laughs> below it. So I guess I like that speakerphone scene because you feel like you're getting more data and then it's actually throwing a wrench in. Mm -hmm. Because if the Harbinger had called and they put him on speakerphone and they laughed, you cut back. If you see the Harbinger's reaction and he's laughing, then you know you can laugh too and this is all kind of a joke and whatever. It's, um, you know, these, these people looking in at these kids and laughing at them. But the fact that the Harbinger works with them, he takes it dead serious but has to interface with right. a modern society that has speakerphone you internally don't know what the fuck to do with that. But tonally, what is that telling you? You're just scared and confused. And then, and then you become the security guard. Yeah. That's what his role is in the film, is right. to be the person from layer one who is in layer two. Yes. Um, layer two is the horror community. Yeah, right. Layer two is you and me and 90% of the people that listen to Double Feature sure. and 100% of the people that go to the Music Box right. Theater. Right, right. They're all, yeah, here come the tits, here come the tits, show me the tits. <laughs> right. Yes, tits. Yeah. Uh, they're betting on the merman because they've never seen one. Right. Meanwhile, the security guard is, is taking it seriously, going, this is people's lives we're dealing with. Sure. I mean, you're killing people here. Why is this funny? How can you make a joke about this? Why are sure. you placing bets on how these people will die? Sure. Because he's not a horror guy. Yeah. He doesn't, he's not... I guess what people will call it jaded or desensitized, yeah, but sure. uh, accustomed is what I would sure, like to call yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so he goes, why, why do there need to be boobs? Yeah. And people like you and I go, shut up, is why. <laughs> yeah. Leave uh, it alone. Don't talk about yeah. it. This is just how it is. This is how it is. We have a thing here to do. You know. You don't understand. What's at stake. You don't understand <laughs> what is going yeah, on. Yeah. There's a certain amount of things that need to happen for yeah. this to be... Now, in the film, they say for this to be the correct rite, the sure, ritual, the sacrifice. Sure. But what they're really saying is there's a certain amount of things that need to happen for this to be an American horror film. Right, yeah. <laughs> and I feel like our vantage point is really well represented. And in, in the even a better way than you or I could do it, by a perfectly Whedon actor. She was in Dollhouse, and she's been in some other things. But she has a conversation with him that's just, oh, we're just blowing off steam. You yeah. know, it, gets, it gets really hard here. Sure. And she's, tr she's not just dismissing him. She's trying to say, you know, I'm a human being too. Mm -hmm. You just don't understand how things are down here. Right. It's just fucking perfect. She does it so well. 
I want to skip right from that to the wolf makeout scene. Okay. I feel like that does it does something in that scene Cabin in the Woods doesn't do anywhere else. And that's really interesting to me when a movie just decides to take a one off like that. Uh -huh. You have a scene where if we're gonna use our, our mythical The archetypes I think are the easiest way to yeah, do it. That's where what the, the film horror wants is us making to do. out with I won't say the wolf, but a wolf. Uh huh. And it's a scene that it's a perfect trailer scene, is what it is. It's one of those things that when I was on the fence about do I go at midnight and I saw that just surreal Lars von Trier esque uh -huh. what the fuck is going on? I'm up oh, I'm there. That's it. That's all it took for me. But it's, it's the best just dark, artsy, fucked up, it pushes a boundary. Yeah. I mean, that scene is, that's what it is. It pushes a boundary. That's mm -hmm. why it's there. You're in a room with these people, and they're comfortable with each other, and then something happens, and the movie wants to go, it looks at a film like Martyrs, and it says, or even Funny Games, and it goes, there was some serious boundary pushing. That's uh -huh. what those films are. I want to pay tribute to that, too. But I'm not in a boundary-pushing film. I'm in sure. a commentary. A lot of people fucking saw this. Cabin in the Woods was very popular. Uh -huh. um, partially what you talked about, just the non-horror audience being addressed in there, too. But you do have a scene that goes, you know what? We've seen Martyrs. We're going to show you a really fucking awkward sure. wolf make-out, just sick, twisted, whatever. And then never come back well, to a scene like that. And what better way to immediately illustrate this girl is a slut? Yeah, sure. And, I mean, it's not even the typical. The typical way to do it would be to have her fuck one guy and then have her fuck sure, another guy. Sure. But the reason that I don't like that idea is because it gives the impression that the slut archetype right. sleeps around. Sure. But it's not that. It's just that she's heavily sexually she's active. She's a party girl. She's yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the archetype they're really aiming at. Sure. She's the yeah. type of girl who will seduce a wolf head <laughs> right. just because people are going to get off on yeah, it. Yeah, because they're going to watch it and right. they're going to remember, you know. And, and that that's way. that's the moment where you kind of realize that these people who weren't these different ideas when they got to the cabin sure. are falling into these roles. And part of it is because of the fact that they're facilitating all of this downstairs. Sure, they have the yeah. little, the gas that, um, what is it? Um, we should split up the, we should split up gas. Sure, yeah. Um, <laughs> I love which is, that. yeah, it's so funny, but, but you have these personalities and this is, this is one of, I mean, if you want to talk about things that are, we didn't ask, um, I love the types of characters he writes because he makes them seem so natural when really they're, we talked about that with Firefly yeah. and stuff and shining. I mean, it's, it's unnatural stuff yeah. and he just goes, no, 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 that's, that's what happens. Don't worry about that. But he has these people that, when you meet them, they are playing their characters like they're in a horror film. But they're making jokes about, you know, when they're in her house and the, the right before the fucking bong coffee yeah, sure. mug shows up. And uh, they're basically... Well, and there's the books. The yeah. books is... Well, that's yeah. What, yeah, that's what I'm talking yeah. about. And the allusion to, you know, sleeping with the teacher and mm -hmm. everything. Uh, Pre-med student. I mean, these are smart kids. Yeah. They're smart, they have a good sense of humor, like, sure. they have some wits about them. They are not flat stereotypical. They're not they're not characters. Jason victims. No, they're not at all. But they but have they to be become that. Jason yeah, victims. They have to become that. Yeah. And I love that the movie takes just a second to point that out, sure. just so you don't forget. Well, and the other thing that the movie does that I think is brilliant, and it also invokes a lot of very deep stuff, sure. is that downstairs in layer two, they're making them kind of they're the, the they can make whatever choice they want sure but we have to get them into the basement <laughs> right you know they they can they can do this that and the other thing but the whore has to die first so maybe right. we'll turn up the light on this little this little patch right, of grass right, so sure. that she doesn't get inside right you inspire and, these people to right come and these so cliches. you get this idea of okay how much of this ritual needs to be free will when you sure. can literally facilitate sure you know this door opening or telling them to split up. Sure. Um, and the, it, the question gets probed downstairs, you know, how is this free will? You're just killing them. No, right. no, 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 <laughs> right. no. We're facilitating. Right. But right. they're making the decisions themselves. They I have love the to movie choose. having that debate too. Isn't oh, that yeah. great? The fact, it's just like with the characters. The fact they stop and go, wait, that guy is not an athlete. And, yeah. you know, that girl's not a whore. He and, threw a football. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> 
And, you know, it stops to go, remember when these characters weren't this? Because really, you don't have a lot of time to spend with these people, but we want to make sure you know this yeah. isn't who they are. Yeah. And it does, you know, it does the same thing it's, with the free will thing. It's, it's just bringing yeah, it up. It's just downstairs creating what they need in order right. to satisfy downstairs. Sure, And then sure. it's up, it's the top layer becoming what needs to happen. Right. It's right. all these different layers interacting to create, again, this alignment of what needs to go down in this hour and a half. Well, sure. And it all goes wrong. It goes wrong for them because they don't suspect that these characters are real people. Right. They think they have sure. so much control. You know, they're walking the fine line between giving them free will right. and maybe they give them a little too much. Or, you know, one of the departments screw. I love that, too. The compartmentalization of, oh, talk to demolition, who's uh -huh. in engineering. You know, the world that they've built there, the... Um, the mythology of these horror tributes is incredible. But, yeah. you know, the character coming back, the fool coming back in the end, and that's another huge Whedon thing, too. That's one of my favorite things he does in any of his stuff. And you see that throughout Buffy, and you see it in Dollhouse. I mean, you see it in the fucking Avengers. He takes these characters that are the comic relief, the small, the throwaway characters. Seth, Seth Green. Yeah, he takes... <laughs> yeah. He takes the fucking Bong character and he makes him the hero. And this movie is all about exploiting that one fucking sure. Whedon thing. Just going, just really looking at it and going, yeah, no one expects this thing I do. Mm -hmm. This thing every fucking time where I go comic relief character, saves the day, is the hero, does something pivotal, sure. or just is more important than... Right. He well, doesn't have to always save the day, but no. just that he has a real role and he's a real person. Or that... Or that the situation is particularly tailored to someone like him. Well, that if too, you look yeah. at Joss Whedon films and you look at and you look at Cabin in the Woods, the normal thinking person would die. Yeah. The crazy person who sure. happens to go, "What is this camera about?" Right. And right. believes in all these conspiracy theories. This is the one time they're going to shine. Sure. So yeah, they come back and they're an effective, sure, and formidable character. Well, the other characters, had they seen a ca uh, camera, probably would have just written it off. Yeah. They probably would have gone, no. I'm they probably wouldn't have even is. seen it. Well, that's, yeah, that's where you begin with that. But I, even if they had, I just feel like, you're right, you know, that, that character's so perfectly suited for that yeah. scenario. Whether these, can, and that's what I love, too, is he's always having these underdogs step up in different ways. Whether the character has a particular skill set that's used for something, or they overcome adversity for some reason, or you know what, you just he wants to surprise you. You thought they were a throwaway character. It turns out they have something to add. It's just it's one of my favorite things that he does. So I want to talk about this mythology part too. I want to spend some serious time talking about the basement level because I know people who listen to the show and love the kind of things we talk about. That's mm -hmm. where it's at. For sure, them. that's where they live. Well, they saw yeah. that and they just watched. They just watched double feature slide by them in big glass boxes. Yeah, that's yeah, that's what happens, uh -huh. right? This mythology is. You know, it's horror tributes, but it's, uh, you get down there and it's these technicians and this, I think the thing that's most emblematic of it is the erase board. Mm -hmm. That's what people are going to, you know. Screenshot. Real, yeah, real horror fans are going to see this and that's the one fucking scene. They're more than anything else. They're going to go, what's on that board? I did it. Pause that. Of course yeah. you did. Of course you did. <sighs> you know, you go through all that and I've had entire conversations about Cabin in the Woods yeah. with people that go on for hours just about that fucking right. board. Kevin. And everything. Yeah, what everything the fuck is Kevin? Yeah. <laughs> we'll put that on the site, too, and people can go. Sure. It's doublefeatureshow.com. They can go and look at that. But I love living in that world, just that dark technical office job. Uh -huh. Just what a surreal fuck. Sure. And when they're placing bets and stuff, just being down there is, man, that is where it's at. Mm -hmm. But this movie, and this is another thing that one of my big takeaways from Cabin in the Woods, one of the things I, I think really makes it one of my favorites, is you have a movie that on our show, before they, oh, this elevator can go down, do we want to go down? Is that yeah. you know, a good idea? Before that scene, this movie to me is a perfect fucking time. Sure. It is right up there with every old school American horror, Splat Pack, Alex Aha, fucking... Wolf Creek, uh -huh. you know, my favorite moments of high tension, uh -huh. uh, just every hatchet, you know, all of that stuff. Well, I mean, you have, you you do have a bear trap on a chain. Right. I mean, yeah. you can't go wrong with a bear trap yeah, on a chain. Yeah, totally, totally. And so I'm already loving this movie for just being surface 
and kind of forgetting in the back of my head what it what I know it'll become because a you know an eagle flies right. into an invisible wall uh -huh. like there's more here clearly, but I'm just a perfect ten, and then it it fucking breaks its own scale, man. Mm -hmm. It just. It goes, you know what, Perfect Ten is actually not enough to qualify this movie anymore because I'm going to add this layer that's going to make you interpret this on a whole different level and suddenly, it, you know, you thought you were just dealing with fun horror film and now you have, you know, new French extremism yeah. uh, type commentary film and done in an American way, done sure. in a very digestible, very let's talk about... Done in the orphans. office. Yeah, yeah, right, done in the office. <laughs> yeah. So you get these boxes too. Yeah, with I Hellman. Mean, yeah, <laughs> Hellman. <laughs> what what is Hellman? Hellman is, um, I guess you would call him Bladehead. Bladehead. Okay, that's also a, a fine one for that. But he goes. The board has him listed as Hellman. I feel like they're just high fiving us. Oh yeah. I feel like the movie is just. There are just certain things. Thank you, double feature. Oh, and, and made it for us. And it ends up when when and this is such a wonderful moment. The elevator's beeping. Oh, the, the ding elevators and ding. everything opens. Oh, and every time it dings, you go, oh, here we go. You can't see this on my notes, which are sitting just outside the tiny, dark uh, closet we're recording in. But I have elevator ding yeah. uh, listed as one of my things on there. I mean, once you, so you're taking this trip down there and you're going through, and this is after the erase board and the, you know, zombie family thing uh -huh. and all the boxes and all that. And. You know, we're going to get Sigourney Weaver later, which is just another, hey, community, hi, everybody who saw the alien uh -huh. films, you know. Um, but you get that elevator ding, and just everything you've gotten excited about just... Happens all at once. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. It, it I, actually, it happens at a speed that I'm actually upset with I know, because I my know. throttle has gone all... I know. I'm like, wait, 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 hold on, yeah, I can't slower, watch everybody kill everybody. Slower. yeah. Yeah, I and know. Then, you're so excited for each individual story, and they all happen at once, and you're almost mad. Yeah. You really are. You're, well, because you want to stop, and what I what I wanted to do... You want miniseries. No, what I wanted to do is I wanted to go back and take a screenshot of that fucking board, pause both, and go, okay, there's, the, okay, the, there's the giant yeah. snake, and there's... Sure, there, sure. Oh, she's the sugar plum fairy. I get right, it. All right. right. And this is, you remember the excitement I had? You were first introducing me to Slashers, and we had done all the Jason films, and I fell in love with Jason stuff. And then we did the Freddy films, and Robert England is incredible. And then I knew there's a movie called Freddy vs. Jason. Yeah. That's what's happening here? Yeah. But with it's every, it's horror. Characters. It's it's all monsters, all out horror fest. And in in a five second yeah. scene, and it's funny as fuck. Yeah. The elevator dings, and you go, oh, it's gonna come out. And you anticipate like mm, maybe the movie's really gonna whip it out, and it's gonna be three or four different. But it's every goddamn yeah. monster to the point where you you can't even. Right. It's it's well, snake then, from Buffy versus you know creepy doll face people. Right. I mean, it's and all then of you those start put playing, together. And then you start playing the game of okay, what if what if they picked that one? Right. Yeah. What if yeah, they yeah, picked yeah. the unicorn? Yeah, absolutely. Like, the unicorn is what running around is this that? cabin, yeah, I know. killing people. This movie gives you a hundred thousand films in your mind, and and you'll you're in the have. basement again, looking around, going, "What summons what? Who? You yeah. know?" And you yeah. can look at that and go, "Okay, well, he almost summoned the merman, and sure. that guy had the hellman, sure. Lamont configuration, yeah, right. and she had the music box with the little sugar plum fairy dancer girl, yeah, and right. The bride. I don't know who the bride is, sure, but she had sure. the bride, and." Then it's the fucking Buckners, <laughs> right? And I know that isn't that the best. And it's it's the thing where you're like, oh okay. And and on the board, it's what pain pain loving cannibal redneck family right, or right. some shit. And on the board, the amount of adjectives make it exciting, but nothing is more exciting than molesting tree. I know. I mean, I know. you get. So I should put this out here, and I just want to make sure we're on the same level. You're terribly disappointed that that's the yeah, pick, right? That's yeah, what you're getting to here? Yeah. yeah, and they seem disappointed, too. I mean, yeah, because that's the least fucking interesting sure. one. But, and that's I think that's why that's the one they oh, pick. Oh, yeah. Oh, hell yeah. Is because, for one, horror movies tend to let you down at that moment. <laughs> right. The, the moment they show the monster, yeah. right, yeah. is always the letdown. Yeah. And so they go, okay, well, since the monster's going to be the letdown, we can't really make a movie where... 
a giant snake is going around sure, this cabin, sure. and that's interesting. Sure. But what we can do is zombie fodder this shit right. with your standard wrong turn type sure. bad guys. Yeah. Um, and you know they know it because they're barely in there yeah. at all. The Buckners are yeah. not. They, their screen they're a tool. Time is, yeah, they're totally. a tool, but they're not the monster. You spend more time looking around the cabin yeah. than, than they even exist. And, in the... and so in that way, they knock that out yeah. when, the, when the fucking elevator doors open. You don't need to search for the cannibal redneck family right. because who cares? Yeah, That's not the one you're looking the for anyway. Yeah, right, right. Which you need because you're trying to pick out the... The diamonds amongst you know the free money load that's uh-huh. falling out of this. Uh, uh, well, I was sitting there the whole time going, "Wait, is that a witch or a sexy witch?" <laughs> right. It, the scene alone, you could just watch uh-huh. all day, and the way it's delivered too. I mean, I can't. It's such a small moment for us to spend so much time on, but the way it overwhelms the senses, the way that that is exciting but hilarious, and just a bloodbath, mm-hmm. just a fucking carnage bloodbath is so i don't know it's fucking perfect there's just the humor in it It, i love it um i wanted to ask you about the bike crash too so this is kind of a weird thing so this is one of those things that we saw the eagle in the beginning Uh it's in the trailer um i know it's in the trailer because i have to stress test machinery and one of the technicians i work with she really loves cabin in the woods so she does the stress test with the cabin in the woods trailer so I see this about as much as I see Videodrome for the <laughs> show. And, you know, the eagle moments in there, the bird or whatever, it flies, it hits the wall. And because it's your first real insight to the two worlds coming together, I think you remember it. When he's revving up that bike, how soon do you know exactly what's going to happen? Um, you know, I don't remember the first time I saw the movie, but it definitely, it's, it's not until too late. Like if <laughs> right. I were there to warn him, sure. If I were so, let's say I'm I'm twenty yards away, right? I couldn't have run to him in time to sure. stop him by sure. the time I remembered. Well, I mean, as an audience member, yeah, they do that in a way that you think about that scene on paper and you kind of go, "Oh, this is supposed to." When he hits the wall, you're supposed to go, "Oh, fuck, that wall's there." Yeah. But I feel like everybody know. I got that sense in the theater. Yeah. I watched this movie in groups. Yeah. I get the feeling that everybody knows it's coming, yeah, well, and it's not a surprise moment. It's more... I've puzzled over this a lot. But, well, yeah, I think everybody's excited to see it happen. I think everybody... Yeah. It's almost like the elevator. You're anticipating... As soon as you see the elevator, and it's quiet, and then the ding goes off, there's a moment in your head. It's a lot quicker, yeah. but a moment where you know shit's going to go down. And when he's revving up on that bike, and they're giving the hero music, I think... Every single person in the audience knows exactly yeah. what's going to happen. I don't know if it's there to surprise. I feel like it's there just so you can kind of revel for a second and, oh, this is going to be fucking sure. awesome when he hits that wall. <sighs> and it's still, it's still funny to me, yeah. even though it doesn't quite get the... If it happened quicker, I think it would get a bigger laugh. Mm-hmm. But I love the lead-up with the excitement and how much just, oh, I can't fucking wait. Oh, he's going to hit this wall. And for a movie that's so rewatchable, yeah. I mean, you're, you're never going to forget yeah. about that wall. You're just going to go, oh, sweet, this is the scene where he hits the fucking wall and it's just, you know, they just show his body for a long period of time just dragging down that <laughs> thing. It's perfect. So Cabin in the Woods, I mean, it does the deconstructing horror thing a la Behind the Mask. It's right, very true. good at the exact same tactic. But it also satirizes the whole horror world. Yeah, That's what it is. That's sure. the top layer is kind of this infinitely, wonderfully executed satire of horror. Yeah. And then it starts dealing with this weird thing where instead of just being about satirizing horror, it starts being cynical of the horror audience. Like, how do you mean? Well, you take, you take the lines, you know, you know, people, it's, um, what is it? The society's filling in the cracks. Oh, with yeah, no, you're concrete. right. No, I totally agree and, with you. Uh, and, I mean, it, it ends up culminating in the end of the film. Sure. And it, it's, it's all the, uh, the fool's character yeah. who kind of does it. But, I'm I mean, totally but cynical. It, yeah. is, it is, there's also the, the, um, the guy from the security guard who's like, you guys are just killing sure, people. Sure, and no, you're having right. a good time with it. Um, so it's being cynical of the horror audience, but in a way that the horror audience goes, yeah, we know we're that way. Yeah. Um, 
And see, that's unique for you and I, because I don't feel like you no, know, neither I don't do feel I. like we're cynical people. No, a lot of people uh, when they talk about our show or whatever, they talk about the humor and the cynicism. Yeah, and we make you know we're fans of dark humor. We make a lot of jokes, sure. but we also spend a lot of time talking about humanism and yeah. feminism and respect for people and sure. ideas and blah blah blah. Yeah, and the film kind of ends with this. I mean, the film ends with this. Over the statement of the whole film is. If this is how society has to survive, we're doing it wrong. Yeah, sure. It's not time for people to do it anymore. Sure. I mean, the guy basically sits there and goes, people are bad. Yeah. If, but not all people. Sure. But, you know, the people running people. Sure. People running humanity, the CEOs of the human race. Right. Are motherfuckers. So you think that cynicism in this fictional world stems from... The ancients. Yes. You think the fact that... So in you and I, in our world, where we don't have ancients, uh -huh. we would presume, right? Sure. Um, we are practical atheists, atheists in practice specifically. We would uh, say, great world, uh -huh. everything's, you know, hooray humanism. Sure. But if there were ancient gods and we were no longer atheists and, you know, we had to put on this fucking show for them... You would say, you know what, we're doing it wrong, humanity's yeah. doomed, let's let yeah. somebody take over for yeah. lunch. So you think the cynicism in their world is warranted? I think it would work, I think it makes sense. Well, yeah, I because guess I, I, think, guess I true. don't think it's fucking fair. Right. It's horrible no, to it's, do that. It's and especially that happens, when, yeah. and, and if you have, to, you have to look at it the way that you've looked at it as somebody who's gone to the film. Sure. Look how much fun you had. Right. With all the different yeah, ways people uh, can die, right. and you're placing bets, and the merman, and sure. the dolls, and the clown, and haha, right. ha, I love all the ways people die, and if that's right. the way society has to work, hooray for me, because it's funny. Yeah. No, fuck <laughs> you, giant hand. Fuck you, giant hand is such a perfect ending. I don't want to let that be the ending where you didn't talk about the Japanese thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's so many, we could do live commentary on this show. Yeah. There's so many things where it's... They fucking cut to Japan, and it is the biggest laugh for me. Yeah. And I start thinking like, oh yeah, you know, whatever, I'm a horror guy, I watch a lot of these movies. But I see this film in, I saw it in a group of people, uh, basically, who, the last time I saw it, um, before the show, who said, oh, we don't watch horror films. And someone else convinced them, no, you know what, I think you're going to like this, and we all watched it. And they fucking loved that they cut to Japan, uh -huh. and, you know, frog. fun, happy tree frog. <laughs> I mean, the whole, it's it's enough just to cut to Japan. It's a ghost spooky thing because everybody knows yeah. the ring. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows that shit. And I was patting myself on the back going, oh, I know spooky Japan movies, but everybody knows that. Yeah. And everybody has a good time with that. And then they turn it into a little, little frog <laughs> and how could Japan fuck this up? And oh, man, So giant hand, the world actually, it doesn't end, but, you know, ancients take over. To have that kind of... I mean, that is, talk about not doing the cop-out ending. That's the fucking ballsy ending you do. Mm -hmm. You do the, oh, we fail. Well, maybe we need to fail. Well, if you're going to suck it up and say that, I want to see your failure. I want to see a giant hand smack you down. And just as the movie was a perfect 10, and then it was a perfect 100, it ends on Nine Inch Nails last. Yeah. As if just to say, Eric, I want to make sure you're one over here. <laughs> there has not been any Trent Reznor in this film. Are we missing anything for the double feature audience? This isn't meant to last. This is for right now. God, that's awesome. We have a website, doublefeatureshow.com, and an email address, uh, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Right, familiar with both. We've been doing that lexicon thing for a while, uh -huh. and while all our cabling is broken, this would be a great time to mention <laughs> that uh, we really don't want to keep doing these in a closet. But as we once said, the donations... <laughs> We're never going to tell you, donate, or the show will not survive. Yeah, because that's not the case. Because here we are in a fucking in closet, closet with an we, iPhone. We this is what the this, show will be reduced this is, to. Yeah, this is, we'll just keep doing this. That's fine. The lexicon, though, as people donate, we're adding terms to our own double feature lexicon at doublefeatureshow.com forward slash lexicon. I think that's the... I think that's There's what There's a button too. on there. It's next to Bad Cat somewhere uh -huh. up there, which is still one of my favorite things to show people. So for every $6 we accumulate in our little donation drive... We're adding terminology from the show we use to the lexicon. And we haven't mentioned it in a little while, and we almost have the whole thing up. Wow. So uh, donate.doublefeatureshow.com. Give us some cash.
So we will have uh, two other movies next time. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do? Well, next time we're going to pay a tribute to this week's show, and we're going to do one film about a guy who's trapped in a box and another film about some people who are trapped in a radio studio. Oh, my God. Uh, oh, no, it's buried, buried in, in Pontypool. <laughs> You're right. This, is, this was premeditated. <laughs> uh, wow. So fitting. So we're in a box right now. And Pontypool is a movie that makes me really sad that I'm not giving my peak performance as uh -huh. a radio host. Yeah. Well, that's what we'll have to do next I time. I hope our sound issues get fixed. Watch more fucking film. And bye. How do you get out of this closet? I don't know. Is that a doorknob? Turn the light on.